Kitania. Good morning, everyone. It's my uh, pleasure today to kick off with the uh, first paper, as it's been my great honour to um, have uh, been part of the process of conserving and researching the amazing early Anglo-Saxon treasure that is the Staffordshire Hoard. In my short presentation today, I shall present some of the key findings from the last 10 years of the project. <clears throat> I shall necessarily have to gloss over much for the full account. I would direct you to the monograph, published today, of course. It isn't my intention to give an account of the circumstances of discovery near Litchfield in the West Midlands, or to consider the Horde's historical or archaeological context in the Kingdom of Mercia. These matters will be dealt with by subsequent papers. My presentation instead considers the metalwork, its quantity, its character, ornamental styles and ultimately date, leading to our conclusion for a likely date of deposition during the second half of the 7th century. Now, the extraordinary character of the Staffordshire Hoard is now well established. It has no direct parallels for its scale, quality or makeup in its local setting, in its Anglo-Saxon setting <coughs> or indeed in wider Europe in the 7th century. Our understanding of its quantities has altered significantly from the initial figures given following discovery. After the removal of soil, revealing many further fragments and ultimately the reassembly of those fragments, the following has been established. By mass, the, there are around 4 kilograms of gold objects and around 1.7 kilograms of silver objects. There is almost no base metal. There are many loose garnets. By fragment count, we ended up at the end of conservation with 4,599 fragments, with the silver found overall to be far more fragmented. So there's an inverse relationship um, between the actual 4 kilograms of gold versus 1.7 kilograms of silver and the far more fragmented uh, nature of the horn uh, relative to silver <coughs> objects. The original K numbering system, based on raffle tickets that were so expediently managed by Kevin Leahy has ultimately been replaced by a new cataloguing system with 697 entries. At least 600 significant objects are recognised within the catalogue, the remainder being fragment groups. In addition, significantly, there are many relationships between objects, indicating a structure to the assemblage. Many sets of fittings have been identified that are critical to understanding what the collection represents. The select character of the assemblage indicated by the deliberate retention only of gold and silver metalwork is further reinforced by the masculine and martial character indicated by the finds. Around 500 objects, that is 80% of the collection by object count, are fittings from weaponry, mostly from the hilts of swords, with only a small number from scabbards. Just three buckles might also come from weapon harness. But as, as has long been pointed out, the iron blades are not present, nor are there any gold coins, and nor are there any female type objects, such as brooches. There is, however, at least one magnificent helmet and a collection of large and elaborate mounts, some of which may be from war gear. Lastly, of course, there is the small but very significant collection of church treasures, including the great gold cross with its, and, and the, the strip with its biblical inscription. The new findings do not challenge what was apparent early on, that ours is a war hall which must in some way relate to the cauldron of bloody conflict from which the early kingdoms of England would emerge. All of the objects can be accommodated on the battlefield. There are at least 74 pommels, 159 hilt collars and hilt rings, 170 plates from the guards of swords, 
and over 120 other small mounts thought to come from the hilts of swords and fighting knives. Most of the pommels are of cocked hat form and closest to Melin's type Beckham Volstanarum, which is dated broadly from 570 to 650 AD. But a smaller number of the pommels take a round back form, more typical of the 7th century. As Leslie Webster long ago argued, the Horde's great gold cross and other Christian treasures, including the pectoral cross and inscribed strip, can be seen as representing small contingents of churchmen on the battlefield. All, therefore, is elite war gear. Furthermore, the weapon fittings come from the swords and knives of leading warriors, and likewise the church gear must have belonged to religious figures in royal retinues. There is nothing from the rank and file of an army. In this, the horde represents a great departure from the view of the warrior that we had become accustomed to, as presented by the rusted iron fittings from shields, spears and swords from the period's thousands of weapon graves. By contrast, furthermore, when swords from burials have been found with hilt fittings, they are typically of base metal. Very, only very occasionally are they so grand as those that we have in our hall. <coughs> there are a small number of objects that appear princely, even royal. The helmet is chief amongst them, but there are also some large mounts that are suggested as possibly fittings from saddles. There's one reconstruction illustrated here. So we may also have the possessions of the commanders of armies, as well as those of their sub-command. Almost all of the objects show damage that was done before burial. The evidence suggests crude but systematic removal, a harvest of bullion, or harvests. No care was shown for the contemporary high social and artistic value of the pieces, and with only a small number of exceptions, reuse would not have been possible for the objects. Cut marks are frequent, and it has been possible to capture some fascinating details with photo micrographs. Knives were used to chop open parts and sometimes to lever, with even the point of the blade apparent in some cases. There are, additionally, dents from smithing tongs used to pull pommels from the ends of swords. This may be a clue to the class that undertook the dismantling, the smith, the class that would also have had the specialist knowledge to separate out gold from gilded metalwork. But there is some damage too that appears non-incidental, being instead deliberate in targeted, perhaps even iconoclastic. On our pectoral cross, one arm is bent and the other is broken. The arms are of strong construction and considerable effort would have been needed to have broken it. The predominant style of the weapon fittings represented by multiple sets of pommels and hilt collars, comprises all over coverings of gold filigree, typically with the filigree forming interlace or style to animal ornament. A smaller number of pommels and hilt collars are in a different style, comprising all over cloisonne ornament. Again, the pommels and collars form sets. Together, the many sets identified indicate without question swords and fighting knives were being manufactured with matching hilt fittings. It is my contention, furthermore, that such distinctive ornament could represent the output of different regional <coughs> royal workshops and could have functioned thus to convey regional identity and obligation as forms of kingdom styles. A further possible regional style is suggested from the over 100 small mounts in the collection, from the grips and guards of swords. <coughs> Recognised as similar to examples on a preserved horn hilt in the British Museum, shown here, I have turned it the Cumberland hilt style. 
Next, therefore, is to consider where such regional styles might have originated, and this is currently very difficult, due to the lack of parallels for the Horde's objects generally, and because most of those that we do have are single finds with poor understanding of their depositional context. A very close parallel for the filigree style, as well as for the techniques of manufacture seen in the Horde, is the metal detected find from Market Raisin in Lincolnshire. The small yellow triangles on this map, you can just about make out, indicate further examples of related pommels with filigree, all over filigree ornament. They plot a distribution across the Anglian kingdoms north of the Thames. Perhaps, perhaps, an origin for the style in the kingdoms of Lindsay or Northumbria might be possible. Though also the absence from the Kingdom of Kent is interesting, as is the approximate alignment of some of the finds along the Roman road system. There are even fewer pa parallels for the Horde's Cloisonne style fittings, which are the red dots on the map, just three of them. With the far apart examples from Sutton Hoo and Dinham chief amongst them. The principal clue to a possible regional origin for the style is the quality of the cloisonne. Both the geometric and zoomorphic styles of cloisonne seen on the weapon fittings and on other objects in the collection have their best parallels in the metalwork of Sutton Hoo and the wider East Anglian Kingdom. Uh, I shall return to this point shortly. The Cumberland hilt was found during the 19th century somewhere in the modern county of Cumbria, and it alone is sparse evidence for where the related proportion of hoard fittings might have originated. Though it is tempting to suggest they might possibly represent another northern style, perhaps of Greater Northumbria. There are, in addition, a number of mounts of animal form on this side of the slide that it is argued come from the grips of weapons, though they have no direct parallels. And the accompanying drawings show how they would have been inserted, they how this mount, for example, would have been inserted, flush with the, um, with the grip. The set of a pair of birds that also has a fish that accompanies it also has its greatest affinities with the garnet claws on it of uh, the Kingdom of East Anglia. A further key characteristic of the metalwork is animal art, with over 140 examples. The art represents a key intellectual heritage for the early 7th century, prior to and during the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity. Successive traditions were widely shared across Europe, with repeated motifs and forms representing the likely remains of a pictorial system of Germanic pagan belief. Pommel 57, here, stands out in particular for its rich iconography, with 14 creatures of varied species in total. Most notable are the little boar heads at the apex, for they represent a sort of Anglo-Saxon joke. The little boars wear helmets, they represent an inversion of the idiom of the boar-crested helmet, such as we encounter it in Beowulf. Instead of a boar-crested helmet, we have a boar wearing a helmet. Common to many pommels is the motif of a pair of creatures. Here, you can see it on these, on these pommels. Often shown fighting. They can, there can be no doubt it had meaning and it can be traced back to long before the arrival of Christianity. The most striking instance of its use, together with bird beaks, is on the side of Pommel 52. So here it is, and here's the pair of bird beaks. Here its Germanic character was set in deliberate opposition, but not necessarily confrontation, with an early Christian-inspired design on the other side of the Pommel. This one here. The design's unusual arrangement of arches and crosses can be compared with that of a basilica on a Byzantine weight of approximately similar date. 
This pommel with its pagan, Germanic and Christian imagery is just one of many objects in the hall that open a new window on this important period of intellectual transition. Most of the animal art is of the form known as Salim's style too. Just two hilt collars have the preceding style one, making them two of the earliest objects in the collection. Both styles have long been studied for their chronological development, and the style two of the horde in particular has been important for our dating. Arriving at a date for the collection is not straightforward. Radiocarbon dating of its rare organics has not been possible, and there are no coins in the collection. <coughs> Furthermore, its atypical object forms have few well-dated parallels. In quantity, the style two represents an approximate doubling of the corpus prior to the hoard in England. It therefore presented a great opportunity for reconsidering the style's use in Anglo-Saxon England. My conclusion has been to propose a new understanding of style two in England, in the form of an early version and the late version. The early form can be found across Europe, but the late form developed somewhere in Anglo-Saxon England. The dating for the two forms of style two was arrived at by stylistic comparison of the ornament with examples from well-dated contexts from England and Europe. In early style two, the key creature is the zoomorph with a little head surround, a jaw, and often a serpent, serpent-like body, although sometimes with abbreviated limbs in the form of a curl or a single hind leg. <coughs> Examples can be found on filigree, <coughs> cast, and sheet metalwork across England, but focused in the southeast with key dated instances from England at Pricklewell, Alton, and at Sutton Hoo. The earliest examples, however, appear in Scandinavia in filigree on weapon fitting, like the example shown at the top here from Langeland in Denmark. This agrees with the currently accepted position that Style II developed first in Scandinavia, around the mid-6th century, before spreading across Europe by the last quarter of the 6th century. In Anglo-Saxon late style too, the zoomorph, the key creature, is replaced by the quadruped in profile, an altogether more recognisable creature. It is harder to find well-dated examples, but key are those from Mound 1 in, at Sutton Hoo. It seems this form of style two most likely came into use in the 7th century, in the early part. In fact, this creature form has long been regarded as generally later in Anglo-Saxon studies, being the same that we ultimately find in early manuscript illumination. So, what I am proposing actually represents more of a formalisation of the observation of, of others, including George Speak and Karen Hoyle Nielsen about an entirely new conception. Indeed, especially relevant for considering the dating of one early manuscript, the Book of Darrow, is the very close likeness of the animal form seen on some of the latest objects in the hall. The great gold cross and one of our pommels and can be compared directly with uh, one of the objects in terms of its shape, in terms of limb position, to uh, animals in the Book of Darrow. I have mentioned already the connection between some of the metalwork of the Staffordshire Hoard with that from Sutton Hoop. The linkages extend beyond general observations concerning quality of manufacture to include signature details, which I believe support an argument that a proportion of the objects in the collection originated from royal workshops in the Kingdom of East Anglia. A key connection, first identified by Karen Hoyle and Nielsen, is that of a motif on the cross that was copied from one that is seen on the maple wood cups in the Mound One burial. Here it is on the arm, and here it is on the maple wood cup. And in fact, on the other arm, there's a, a modified version of the same motif. 
Another is the frequent use of mushroom cell work in the garnet cloisonne, the, the mushrooms up here. Um, whilst not unique to the Kingdom of East Anglia, so-called mushroom cloisonne appears to have achieved a popularity in the region that is not observable in cloisonne manufacture elsewhere, notably in the Kingdom of Kent <coughs> and across other areas of southern England. And further affinities are found in the execution of the animal art, notably in the tiny detail of the Y-shaped division of the beaks of birds, seen here on the great gold buckle from the Sutton Hoo Mound Mon Burial, and again seen in the cloisonne on the bird from the purse. And we have the very same tiny Y-shaped detail, both in cast and in size style too, and in the garnet cloisonne. And then there is another further linkage in, the terms of, in terms of the use of rare garnet cosoni forms, cut garnet forms that we find in the hoard and that we only had parallels for in, at Sutton Hoo. Uh, more, uh, a link that was pointed out quite early on is our link between um, our lovely, beautiful Sayax fittings, reconstructed here as the fighting knife, and uh, the very close. Um, you know, in terms of quality link that they show with the subtle shoulder clasps. In addition to the ornamental styles so far presented, another is demonstrated by some of the latest silver metalwork, which we have termed the early insular style. The group includes three uh, the group includes three magnificent silver pommels, one of which is shown here. Two of them have gold mounts on one side only, of, the, of their silver cast forms, and all have the novel feature of two ring knobs on their shoulder, that are part of the sword ring tradition, the latest form of the sword ring tradition that we see across Europe. However, no other pommel in Europe has two knobs. Ours are unique. The pommel here shown, number 76, has a pair of collars that we believe went with it and a pair of silver guards, which again are unique from early Anglo-Saxon England, but which do have affinities with Scandinavian fittings. And here we've reconstructed its original glorious form. The early insular style of metalwork has been so called because it appears to anticipate the full insular style combining Anglo-Saxon and Celtic arts that we see manifested in the earliest manuscripts. Some of its characteristics are shown here on an extracted page from the book, together with comparander on this side. In particular, tight interlace is a, is, is a part of uh, its expression. But we also have examples of little animal heads that look remarkably Celtic, and Triskels, and Triskelions, and Triquetras. As well as considering the typology and style of the objects, every find was assessed for its wear, or for signs of repair, aspects that affect consideration of data. An example of heavy wear is that shown on silver pommel 68, where the decoration of the tops, edges and ends of the pommel has been worn smooth by decades of use. On these two photo photomicrographs we have contrasting light and heavy wear seen on different pommels, with gold filigree in this, in this instance. Overall it was found that objects with early style too showed more instances of heavy wear in contrast with only light wear seen on objects with late style too. Two cases of repair are shown here. One is a garnet boss from our great gold cross, broken and repaired, and another is this pommel here which had two red glass settings to replace perhaps lost garnets. The patterns of wear observed, agree generally with Sue Brunning's findings from her study of other North <coughs> European swords. The wear occurs mainly on fittings at the extremities of the hilt, shown as red on our schematic. Probably it was due to rubbing against clothing, with the weapons worn habitually as elite masculine costume. 
In addition, longitudinal fine scratch marks have been identified on the plates of lower weapon guards, which it is argued were caused by the routine polishing of the weapon blade. To conclude my presentation today, I present the data, and from it our estimated date of deposition for the collection. The metalwork is not all of one phase, it was manufactured over a period of more than a century in total, though the bulk belongs to the late 6th to mid 7th century. Probably most was made and in use in the first half of the 7th century. The earliest phase comprises silver material with style 1 or early style 2 ornament, much demonstrating heavy wear. These fittings might have come from so-called heirloom weapons that circulated for decades before they came into the hall. The middle two phases comprise the bulk of the gold material. The earlier gold face is closely associated with early style two and filigree manufacture. The later gold phase is associated particularly with garnet manufacture, garnet bolzone manufacture, and with uh, later style two. The final phase comprises our silver material with the early insular style. Note that this phasing has implications for considering the metal economy of the time. For it proposes a rich gold phase of manufacture that was preceded and succeeded by phases of silver manufacture. This is undoubtedly a simplification, but it is consistent with the trend observed by other studies that there was a sudden influx of gold to England from late in the 6th century, but it was brief, with the debasement in coinage in particular suggesting that already by the 640s supplies of the precious metal were again running short. In the hoard, therefore, we are presented with a true golden age, not only of artistic genius, but also in actual terms. Finally, the proposed dating of the material has led to a revised date of deposition. We now believe the collection was most likely buried at some point in the third quarter of the 7th century. Thank you.